Hi, I'm indie fantasy author Melinda Cusera. Welcome back to Fantasy Lore and More. And today we're here with Simon Graham. And so welcome. And he's here to talk about his novel, Dark Lament. So let's hear what that's all about. Hi, Melinda. Away. Thanks for having me. Um, so this is Dark Lament. It's the glossy cover, so it's got kind of a shine going on there. Um, it is an entry in the fantasy self public SPFBO. I, I can't. I can't do the rest. So it is a dark fantasy inspired by the Crusades. It is the first book in the Black Crusades series, and it is secondary world fantasy. When good men forsake the light, humanity pays the price, and the dead will collect. Vass was raised to be a clerical healer who channels the light of heaven. When he loses his uncle, Vass rejects the light and embraces necromancy to bring him back. The cost is the lives of several around him, including the sister of the girl he loves. Vast seeks to understand the horrors he has wrought while seeking absolution for his sins. But when dark forces seek him out, Vast must choose between watching his family die or become darkness itself to save them. The premise when I first came up with the idea for the book was, what if Luke Skywalker had chosen the dark side to save Han and Leia and everybody he cared about except fantasy? and darker because there's horror in everything I do. So this is, and to me, dark fantasy is horror in a fantasy setting with fantasy tropes. And I also wanted to bring in some, and it might sound silly, but D and D character classes. I wanted to put them in a story where they seemed believable and real. So there are some, you'll see some familiar things there like clerics and paladins, necromancers. There is a, uh, plan for this year to have book two out it is like i said it's a series it's planned for four to five books it was originally planned for four but one of them's kind of being split into two book two should be out later this year it'll be called the iron cross book three we're looking at next year and probably book four next year. So book three is heretic song and i don't have a name for four yet so that's 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 the plan so far how about you read us some of Dark Lament so we can sure. get a feel for it. I'll just read the, the opening um, scene here. Sure. The dead man seized a handful of blonde hair that jerked the woman's head back violently. She let out a squeak, a single squeak as he forced her closer, his mottled gray face inches from her as she as he drew ragged breath into rotting lungs. Where is the boy? The stench of death wreathed the farm like a morning fog, penetrating even the rabbit hutch where the boy hid. He clutched a tawny doe to his chest as if sh she w could protect him from the horrors displayed beyond the latticework door. It began when Mother first noticed a small crowd of people on the road from the city. As they drew near, something about them convinced her to hide the boy in the hutch. Quiet now. Do not make a sound or come out until I come for you. Now they numbered in the hundreds. Some were long dead and freshly dug from their graves. Others were recently dead. Their shambling movements created a din, but none uttered a sound, as if their voices had not raised with them. Only the lone spokesman, spokesman spoke out. I have searched the varg for him. I know he is here. The dead man gurgled. He had loose bunches of hair that clung like grimy strings from a white scalp. His face was skeletal, with gray flesh that clung to it and so like a soggy burial shroud. Mother grimaced, struggling to avert her face. I'll die before I give you my son, she rebuked her fetid interrogator through gritted teeth. The dead man smiled, the expression splitting the flesh at the corners of his mouth. Yes, you most certainly will. He forced a chuckle that sounded more like a croak of a frog drowning in mud. Let her be, yelled a man outside of the child's view field of view. He didn't need to see the speaker to recognize father's voice. The boy could not see beyond the wall of dead folk, but the thud of steel on flesh told much of the story. Father might be held back by the dead now, but they could not keep him from his family. The boy's heart hammered in with a mixture of fear and elation. He silently cheered as the dead piled up, then more dead packed in around the hutch. There are so many, the boy thought. His attention was drawn back to mother and the dead man holding her. Just as he reached beneath his soiled tunic, and withdrew a rusty knife. Without another word, he drove the blade into her stomach. Mother let out a croak, but did not scream, not even as he forced the knife all the way in. 
when the dead then the dead man twisted the blade a few times before plunging his entire hand into the wound up to the wrist. He paused there a moment, his eyes locked on hers, then pushed deeper into her abdomen until his arm was inside her up to the elbow. He withdrew it with a, with a squelch and dropped her lifeless body to the ground. Father cried out, still held back by the throng of dead men and women. But mother was already dead, yet another corpse that littered the ground. Father's cries became exclamations of anger, then turned to howls of sorrow and then croaks of pain before he too was silenced forever. The rabbit squirmed and kicked against the boy's grip with powerful hind feet as if she, as if he had squeezed her too tight. The boy let go before she could draw the dead man's attention. The doe stood before the, the lattice door of the cage, sniffed the air, then hopped to the other end of the box with her siblings. Mother lay on the ground. Her face was, her face still turned toward the boy. She was pale-skinned like her son, but fair-haired, unlike the boy and his father. Her eyes were closed, but the boy pictured them as clearly as if they were open, showing the soft blue of a winter morning. Death was a constant on the farm. The boy understood it as something that happened to animals, not people. It was all too much too fast, leaving the boy focused on a single thought. He would never see mother's beautiful blue eyes again. But even as he thought it, part of his mind rejected the idea as impossible. So when mother's eyes opened and locked on him where he hid, a moment of, re of relief and hope flashed through him, but her eyes were wrong. There was no life in them. The winter blue was dull, cold, and as dead as she. Then she clambered forward, moving on hands and feet, scrabbling across the ground like a spider. She wrenched the hushed door open and seized the child roughly by the ankles to drag him from his hiding place. The boy screamed and struggled, but his ordeal had only just begun. So that's really just kind of a introduction to the story. It goes on from there. The rest of the chapter, because I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's kind of long and I'm, I'm fading here. <clears throat> uh, this is my second interview today. Uh, so the rest of the chapter gets into Vass, who is the main character, it is, which you realize quickly is the boy in the preamble there. And it establishes his life where he's being raised by monks since his, his family was killed. And the horror of that day has really shaped his life. So now he's been trained as a spiritual healer. He, at a, at a monastery called Haven Crest, which is kind of a center for learning as well. So he's a, a student there, and he's also being trained by a exiled knight to defend himself. And he's trained to become a, a clerical healer who will travel the world just helping to heal the sick and the, the wounded. But they also help out, the monks of the uh, Havencrest also help out at a, a farming community. And during a farming accident, someone, one of the knights he, he's very close to ends up dying. As a clerical healer, heaven will only allow him to heal those who are meant to live. If it's their time, it's their time, which it was this man's time. And so when Vass rejects that, something else besides heaven answers his call and there's a price for it so in his desperation and with his traumatic past he can't stand the idea of losing someone else so he's open to making this deal and it it sets everything in motion can you talk about who answered his his call for help or is that a giant spoiler that we can't talk about it is uh, for most of the book it's just a dark entity there is a, they call it the pathway that connects the cleric to heaven. It's more just like a corridor. And when heaven doesn't answer him, something else within the corridor does answer him. And it's, it's darkness. He knows it's dark, but he just, he, he can't care because his friend's life hangs in the balance. So there's no price too high for Vass. Correct. Or, or we, well, we'll find out at the end of the book if the price was too high or... The the book is structured, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the British author Brian Lumley. He's a horror author. He's very much in love with his villains. So in every book in his Necroscope series, a large portion of the story is the backstory of one of the villains or who, whoever created the villain or something like that. So in this story, there is it's kind of a story within a story. So as Vass is trying to learn what he's done, what, what it's what the ramifications are, which quick spoiler 
to save, to resurrect someone, it, it takes the lives of others to do it. And that's what set th sets things in motion. He has to read the historical account of the Color Crusades, which took place 200 years before then. And another, um, who was a knight who became a paladin, he was blessed by heaven, but then something similar happened. And he took a dark turn and plunged the world into darkness. And Bass has fallen in the same same footsteps. So history is repeating itself, or yeah. or is it? I guess we'll find it is. out. And that's what he's trying, that's what his mentors want him to learn. So he's learning from his mistakes, and he's trying to make things right. I wanted a character who, no matter what he did, would constantly make things worse, but he was also relatable. He doesn't, I don't want him to come across as a moron, you know, just this idiot who's just bumbling. I want you to understand why he makes the decisions he makes. And every time he does something, he does it for what he thinks is the right reasons, which just makes things worse and worse. So he's, he's, his mentors are trying to learn to teach him through history, you know, what the consequences of deals in the dark with dark entities can, can lead to. And that story merges with the present story by the end, but there are two different concurrent stories that are running until the end of the book. That's pretty cool. So you're back and forth every other chapter or, or it depends on it depends. what's going on. And it, it's, it gets a few chapters into it before things get bad enough that they're like, all right, sit down and read this. And he, it's actually him reading from this historical account of a knight who was there during these dark days. The first Black Crusade is what it was. I see. And the, the series is called the Black Crusade because it's going to be like the second Black Crusade because you know how they, they had in our history, the first crusade, the second crusade, the third crusade. So it's kind of like that. Now, the the people who are teaching him, are are they they're also clerics? or they're... One of them is a cleric and one is an exiled knight who you learn why he's exiled later. And it's like his, his brother ends up have to be resurrected. But so the cleric is teaching him to heal and the knight is teaching him to defend himself because one day he wants to go out into the world as a as a healer to help people and he has to be able to protect himself and th there's a lot of backstory there as well but that's all in the reveal that comes later okay so let's talk about the magic system because it's really interesting about the carter so if he wants to heal someone he's stuck with mundane means or he needs to use this carter to call down extra help or does he have any other magic that at his command that he can use to heal someone how does that talk a little more about that that sounds really interesting Havencrest is just as, as in our world, the monasteries became kind of repositories for knowledge during the dark ages. It's like that in this world. So Havencrest is one of the centers for healing and they teach the medicinal arts as well. So it's just, you know, first aid, Ar you know, archaic, ancient medicine. You know, he can splint a one, you know, a broken leg. He can, you know, do stitches or whatever, but only certain people who are favored by heaven can call on the light of heaven to heal others. And it's something that he's being trained to do that he's not even really supposed to do yet. So one of his mentors is able to do this. Why is he not supposed to be able to do this yet? Is that like an age thing or a skill level? It's an level? age thing. It's a skill level thing and maturity. And it takes two clerics to do it correctly. One who acts as like an anchor and one who actually opens the pathway to heaven and calls on the light. And if the anchor's not there, then you can fall into that pathway, at least your spirit can. So when Vass is alone and tries to do this the first time, he ends up, he's able to do it, but then there are consequences and that's where he meets this dark entity. There are, so it breaks down, what I wanted to do with the whole concept of inspired by the crusades, one of the things, I don't want to make any distinction as to right and wrong as far as that conflict goes. I leave that to much smarter people than me. But there is some agreement as far as the origins of you know the Abrahamic religions. You know the Christians and Muslims agree that it's the same God. It's just the religions that are different. So I thought that I always thought that was an interesting concept. So I created religions, new religions for this world where both sides have paladins who've been blessed by the same God. So then it's even more gray as to who's right and who's wrong, because if you're both 
both sides worship the same God and that God grants blessings to both sides, then it, oh, it makes it even, even harder. That's, that's a cool twist. That's a really cool twist. I had a, a philosophy teacher in college who said that God is like sunlight and the different religions are the pain or the colored stained glass window that we see his light through. So that was his analogy because all world religions are really trying to get at the same thing, be good to each other, et cetera. I thought of it because you were talking about the light in your world, God is light. And that just reminded me of that, that you're doing something very similar, very cool. So then the, the opposite side would be darkness. So we're not talking about one side versus the other in the magic system. The magic system is light and dark. So, and it's just the light of heaven can be channeled to do certain things, and which means that there is, there's a dark side and it's not explored very deeply in this book. I mean, you get that there's heaven and there's the blackened hells is what the, the hell aspect is called. And this entity is hell in the blackened hells or hell adjacent. You get that sense. It is explained eventually, but it's, it's very much a, a light and dark, but I didn't want to just do light and dark. I wanted it to, to make sense in a real world context. Okay. So we can't talk too much about the darkness because that's a spoiler for later in the series is what you're saying. Yeah. More or less. <laughs> that's okay. A you ask me anything. And if I can answer it, I'll, I'll answer it. Now I want to know, like, what can you do with the darkness? Is there anything that you can, you can say about what someone would do if they're channeling that darkness? Like, what would that look like? What would the effect of that be? What would you want to channel the darkness to do? Like if you consciously wanted to do this, because I assume if there's paladins wandering around who are channeling God's light, that there's, what is the opposite side of that? Who's wandering around channeling this darkness? Like so the opposite side would be a necromancer. So they are channeling the darkness and we'll talk about the origins of the darkness. Okay. But, that's fine. That's fair. And, but, what, but what do they do when they channel this darkness? Are they just raising the dead? Are they doing any, do you have any cool spin on the necromancer? That's they can raise the cool. dead. They can communicate with darker animals that would be more associated with darker side of things. They can, so the soul, instead of just talking about the soul, there's a light within each living being. And humans are the brightest lights. And the the brilliant faith is the, is my Catholic church cognate, whatever you want to call it. So they all, one of their traditions is you have to pray over someone for three days after they've passed. That's because the soul stays in the body for three days. So for someone to be resurrected, it has to be within that three days so that you can channel the light of other living beings into them. So necromancy deals with the light of this world, but not it can't touch the light of heaven. But it also deals with the void that's left behind. So because darkness is the absence of light. So once that soul has passed, there is basically an empty space within the body. And through the darkness, a necromancer can split their consciousness and put a, basically a little piece of themselves in each corpse. So for an army, there might be 10,000. There are 10,001 versions of the necromancer's mind. So each individual unit of that army can fight and think like the necromancer would, but with the limitations of whatever condition that body's in. So if it's a body that doesn't have tendons or anything like that, they probably can't even move it. But if it's someone that's more recently dead, then they can pretty much be as effective as if they had, as if they were alive. So who's the villain in this story? Who is the villain? In this, well, Vass begins to experience things because of this contact with the dark entity. And as he's coming to terms with it and learning more about it through his, this historical account, the the nearby town and military academy that's there is attacked by an army of undead and there's a necromancer leading that army who has come for vast vast finds out he's been tiny spoiler he's been hit out there so the, the entire point of him being in this monastery on top of a mountain most of his life is because there's a prophecy surrounding what is the prophecy of that? the fantasy trope of the the prophecy of the one who will save the world I decided to flip that a little bit. This is the one that will destroy the world. So Vast, though, he's a good person. He tries to do good things. He is destined to bring about the destruction of the world. 
So this necromancer has brought this army there to try and reclaim him, to use him as the tool toward that means. There is connection to the the historical account there. So I'm guessing that person who wrote the account, maybe they had a similar prophecy about them. Or we can't say because that's a spoiler. That's a spoiler. Okay, you plead the fifth, no worries. <laughs> there are a lot of reveals, but there was, there was a lot that this book had to do to set up the series. Originally, this book, the idea for this book was a first chapter, and I decided it needed to be expanded, and really, and it was expanded over over years. So the second book starts what, what I originally thought was going to be chapter two in, in a very long book, so I broke it down into to shorter chunks and then expanded to get my 80 to 100,000 words per book or close to 500 pages and reader terms. And we can't talk about book two because it sounds like that would be a, include a lot of spoilers. <laughs> like what book happens one, at the end of book one? It pretty much picks right up where book one ends. Book one is, I wanted to write a story where there was no good answer to a situation. Because I've had many of those situations in my life. Sometimes there's just not a good answer. All the choices are bad. So you always try and make the best of whatever you have. And no matter what Vast does, things are going to get worse. Book two is mostly him dealing with the emotional fallout of things that happened in the first book. But it moves the story forward as far as the Black Crusade. The Crusade part is mostly just the historical account in book one. Book two has more of that historical account, but now we're moving toward a present-day Crusade that's that's starting around the events that he's, he set in motion in book one. So we're following Bass for all of these books. He's yeah, our... He's our guy. He's our Luke Skywalker character that he's the person that we are following and experiencing this world through. Are there any other major characters um, aside from the two that you mentioned that we should There's be watching just, out Vass for? Vass is the main character, the protagonist that you follow. You get his point of view. It's kind of a third person point of view like Harry Potter. Almost everything mm-hmm. you see in, in that world is through Harry's eyes. And that's how it is. With, that's how I wrote this. That there are supporting characters who are with, with him throughout the whole thing. He has the two mentors. There is a, a, a little, like, adopted little brother. And then the love interest who is from the town, the farming town, where he, he helps out sometimes. And you said that you had you wanted to bring in the classes from D&D. So I'm assuming that some of these other minor characters are maybe drawn from those classes or as the series goes on, we'll see more of those other classes of characters or yeah, how did you... I didn't hit on every class, but yeah, there's definitely cleric, fighter, necromancer, paladin so far. Do any of them have a critical role? I'd say they all have. Critical That's fair. I've never played D and D like that's the only term that I know from there <laughs> other than like clerics and things. Um, which is sad because I've had reviews saying that my books are like Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And like when I first saw them, I was like, I don't know what that is. One of these days I'm going to have to like look into it more. Critical Role is actually a really good place to start. The, the very first campaign is is good. I mean, it's it's long. And I, every episode is going to be several hours long. But I listened to it while I was commuting or while I'm doing other things, but it's, it's actually ends up being really good storytelling and they're all voice actors. So it's, it's very entertaining. That's cool. I'll have to look into that. So are there any other, since you mentioned D and D, is there any other D and D elements in your book other than the classes and um, the clerics and paladins? There are, there are some dragons. The original idea for the story was I thought it would be really interesting to create a sand dragon, which this takes place in the mountains overlooking a valley. So there's no sand there, but the historical account does take place in a desert environment. So it wasn't cool enough just to do the sand dragon. I wanted to make him undead. So he's falling apart and rotting, but he's, if you've ever read Dune or watched any of the movies, we're talking that kind of size. It's like the sandworm. Like he, he has reshaped an entire portion of the desert just by existing. So, so wait, so he is like, I've, I've, I'm one of those nerds. I've actually read all six of the original Dune books and some of the 
other books that have been written. I'm just one of those annoying people. So it sounds like he's more like Paul's son who became a sand. Yes, Paul's son became a sandworm and God Emperor of Dude. It is a mind trip of a book. <laughs> it sounds like your sand dragon is on par with that kind of thing because he reshapes the entire Arrakis, their their whole ecosystem. Like that that's part of his master plan. At the end of it, he becomes a sandworm. And it just I will never forget that descriptive passage when he becomes it and his consciousness was like a pearl inside it. This the dragon is one of the, he is a villain. So it's and there's I, no moral ambiguity about this one. He's 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 not a good guy. I, I would argue that 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 Plato by the by God Emperor of Dune, he ain't no hero anymore. Well, you could really Dune, argue whether he's Paul a hero. Was too. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, in in the first one, yes. In the second Dune, no, he is not a hero. Yeah. And, like, nobody is. Heretics of Dune, I think that was the second one. There's, there's no heroes. There's just, everybody is despicable. I think I've just read the first one, and then I read the one. The second one is, like, all politics. There's not... It, it's a lot of politics. There's not. There's not really so much. It's very different from the original Dune, and a lot of people fall down in that. I had trouble getting through it because it's just a lot of politics, and really nothing else happens. And Children of Dune, that one's very good. It's much more like the first one. A lot of stuff happens, and you meet the the two kids, uh, Leto and um, I think her name Alia is the, the sister, I think. And um, God Emperor of Dune is a complete mind trip. Um, He's a complete villain in there. He wrecks the world. I read the yeah the one his son did, the Paul of Dune or something like that. Yeah, there's there's so many. Like yeah, there's there's <laughs> so many. There's some the son did. There's some that um, uh, what's his name did. I read some of the ones that I can't think of his name. I have so many of his books and I can't think of his name. <laughs> yeah, I think um, this was with another author, so it's co-authored. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a but yeah, I was fun. I was definitely affected by Dune, and I just love the the concept of the of a creature that big. I really wasn't even aware of the whole reshaping of the whole ecosystem, but it's the portion of the desert that the sand dragon is in is called the Sea of Endless Waves because of the massive dunes that are created by his movement. But he's been trapped there. So he's kind of corralled, in, but it's corralled in this, you know, third of the continent. <laughs> but he plays a, Porsche, a, a a big role in the historical account. But he's, I w well, he's undead, so he's immortal in that he will always be. And that's kind of fun when you have an immortal villain. You can pop, you know, you can see him in backstory. You can then see him in the current story. <laughs> and there's... It's it's kind of a fun continuity element, especially an undead dragon. Like I'm a big fan of that. That's just cool. I thought it was cool, but the first crusade in the history of this world, they're all they're called the Color Crusades because they're all named for a color. So it was the Crimson Crusade because the the desert was red with blood by the end of it. But it was a war between heaven and the Nephilim, which are their half human offspring who set themselves up as kings and gods. And so the very first crusade wasn't even among men, but the men fought in the armies of the Nephilim. And so this dragon is a holdover from that age. So that was the first crusade. What was the second crusade? The second crusade, I'm not even hundred percent sure how I've done it. I just do it by <laughs> color. I the, stumped the you. The next big crusade is that's mentioned is I think it was the Purple Crusade, but it's a king of basically what would be like Jerusalem in, in this world, who opened the pathway improperly and his spirit fell into it for multiple years, but a demon possessed his body while he was in there and wreaked havoc in the real world or the, the, the living world. So the next crusade was his twin sons fighting over the kingdom of Mar while he was out of the picture. So how did the 
crusades in your series get started? Is somebody just, uh, I, from what I know in, in history, is that like they just decided the crusades that happened in the past from my, my history classes is that they just decided, well, we're going to go take you know, the Holy Land back from whoever's living there right now, because this is our holy commission. We need to go do this. Uh, there was not usually anything it, that's kind of, except one it, of them. It's kind of portrayed that way. Um, so I don't have a Catholic church. The Brilliant Faith is the main, <clears throat> excuse me, is the main church. And the 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 prism, the beacon is the the, the head of that church. So like you were talking about light being reflected in different ways. Right. So the light is the central tenet of this brilliant faith because it's based on light. And he's very much set up like the Pope and the Pope of, you know, of those times was very much a political leader and territory and political power. That, that was all a big part of how a lot of us started. So does the beacon go gather, you know, make a proclamation and, and give some Pretty reason much. why we need to. The historical whatever. account in this book starts with the Green Crusade because it is named after the guy who they chose to lead it. It's they call him the Mad Baron and his family's colors are primarily green. So they just named it after him. And during this crusade, which didn't last very long, his youngest brother became a paladin. So he, during a heroic moment, he was blessed by heaven with, um, with multiple miracles. And then shortly thereafter, he was tempted by the darkness to go the opposite way. And he did. And so the, the green crusade was very short and it started the black crusade because he, he, from there, he conquered most of the world. And almost destroyed the world before heaven intervened to stop them. Wow, that's that's wild. So there was a lot to tell there, and I yeah, Vass is basically they don't I don't use the term reincarnation, but he's considered to be like the reincarnation of the Death Knight, who was the being who plunged the world into darkness during the Black Crusade, and so the Beacon, the head of the church there if he just you know put out a proclamation and you know, right sorry call yes. them to go to war and then so that was he how the green crusade anoint... started okay so yeah. th so they don't all start that way they don't you know anoint somebody to go and lead the crusade and that person gathers their army and goes to wherever to do there's whatever. mention of the gold crusade which was the one prior to that when the the mad baron was young and his father had led it so he was a hero of that crusade even though they were defeated he performed some big miracle and was deemed a hero. And then he went, he, they retreated back to their nation. And then 20 years later, the, the beacon has called for crusade again. And so he answers the call, not because of religious reasons, but because of duty and honor. And, and, and he has a vision that his younger brother will become this great hero. So he he has a vision that his youngest brother will become a hero and he kind of puts him into situations where he will be forced to rise to the occasion. And he does. And there there are some miracles that come out of it. But then he he falls from grace and brings the whole world, tries to bring the whole world down with. Seems to be a recurring theme. Pretty much. Yeah. But Vass has to learn from that and what happened there and try and prevent things from happening and every decision he makes is going to make things worse. Spoiler. <laughs> so, and which is why it's, it's, it's dark fantasy because there's definitely hope, but there's, there's a, as you can tell from the first, just the opening pages, there's a horror element. And I figure if you're dealing with the undead, why not really lean into that? So you're riding the line of dark fantasy and horror, and sometimes on one side, sometimes on the other. Definitely. It's, to me, dark fantasy is horror in a fantasy setting with fantasy tropes. So there's definitely that kind of fantasy story structure, the hero's journey, but just from a, with a horror tone, I guess is, is the way to put it. A lot of fantasy readers will look at it 
at the cover and they might like it or they might not. Horror readers look at the cover and go, oh, that's creepy. I want to like, I want to read that. <laughs> so I, I definitely am hitting the horror mark there. No, and it sounds like that's the right mark to hit, that these, these are the readers who you're looking for. Definitely. This was fantastic. Is there anything else you want to say about The Dark Lament or any of its sequels? The sequel will be The Iron Cross, and then the third book will be Heretic's Song. The sequel will be out later this year, book two. Um, Heretic's Song, looking for early to summer of 2024, and we're going to try and get book four in by the end of 2024. And you said this might be a five book series, so then we'll have we'll be yeah. looking in at twenty twenty five for the end of the series. Yes. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on here and talking about it. Okay. And that was I'm loving the the paladins, the light thing, the magic system that you've created a, a very interesting world and, and some very interesting characters. And I like that Thank you've you. taken the whole Star Wars thing and sort of flipped it. That's very cool. It's the easiest way I can explain it to, to anybody, you know, that elevator pitch concept. Luke Skywalker effective. chose the dark side to save everybody. It's Except effective. Fantasy. Yeah, no, it's effective. And, and then, it, it, you know, that opens it up for you to do a sequel, sequel series where we go the other direction <laughs> if you wanted to. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot in there. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see what happens. You could do the redemption arc. We don't know, no spoilers. We don't know if, if Vast completely goes for the dark side. If he actually does destroy the world, you'll have to wait 2025 for the last book to find out if that's where things go or if Vast changes direction or finds, makes the best of a bad situation and finds another way or builds something better. Sometimes you do have to destroy the world to build something better. There have definitely been books like that. So that's a lot to look forward to. I'm not sure if you're into anime, but Code Geass goes that way like the the protagonist destroys the world so he can build a better one and that, that i'm sure that's an influence as well i do i do like uh, i do like anime my favorite was technoman blade i think it was i have the dvds of it kogios is it's my favorite yeah that that was an older one but yeah, i'll have to look into that it sounds interesting it's not something that you see a lot outside of like dystopian um and they're not destroying the world to make something better. They're destroying the world to make things worse <laughs> in dystopian fiction, usually. So, but, you know, you never know. You could build something better on top of the ashes of the old world. There's, what is that saying? You have to burn it all down to build it back up? Or maybe I'm, maybe I'm making that up. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's the way it goes sometimes. I try and portray stories that make sense in the context of reality. Even though it's fantasy, I want you to look at it and be like, okay, yeah, I get that. You know, and that's very cool because you said earlier that often we are trying to make the best of either a bad situation or if there's no, there's no good solution. So we're just having to pick from a bunch of bad ones and find the least bad. And that is true. That is very true, especially if you're working in an office in corporate America. You're often choosing which is the least bad solution <laughs> to the problem because there aren't any good ones because of staffing, money, whatever, and in other scenarios as well. <laughs> but that, that's the one that comes to mind because it's my reality Monday to Friday. <laughs> I went from corporate America to teaching high school to, to disability. So I understand not having a lot of options. Yeah, it's hard. It, but it sounds like you've made the best of a, the situation. And you, look, you've got this great book to show for it. I'm really proud of it. Thank you. Yeah, I hope you do well in the self-publishing fantasy blog off. Number nine. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I think I you still too. think I'm messing it up. I think it's self-published fantasy blog off number nine. I keep saying self-publishing fantasy, like the fantasy book is publishing itself. Because <laughs> I think I finally some of us got would... to where I can say SBFBO, and that's as good as I got. <laughs> right, and I think he has in his group it's Spiffo. <laughs> I saw some kind of pronunciation guy, and I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I'd do that either. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, that's a little weird. <laughs> if I'm looking so right at it, maybe. But Well, I hope that you 
advance to the semifinals. I know we've got months and months before we find out yeah. anything about that. Me too, definitely. Yeah, I hope so. My book is not anywhere the year is dark. <laughs> things do go wrong for my protagonist, but they'll he does occasionally get things right and things That's get good. things do get better after a while. He does eventually make the right decision. In my books there are actual like there is the right decision, there is the good decision where things will get better. Sometimes Saren doesn't always pick the right thing and I can't make him do anything. So if he makes the wrong decision and things don't get better, it's not my fault. I tried, man. I, I laid out the, <laughs> the path for him and he just he went left instead of right. I story has to follow him. He's the main character. I don't have any choice here. I'm making the best of his bad situation. I understand following characters close my the, the love interest took over the first draft of this book and said oh, this wow. book's about me. And Vass became kind of a, a side character in his own story. So I had to carve out a big chunk of it to get it back on the track. But she is most people's favorite character. Right now. Sounds like she's got, there was a lot of story for her. Maybe you can do another series. Maybe you can do a book from her perspective. It's because sometimes it's fun to do. You've read a whole thing in one perspective and then you get, but it's never the same story because they're not with the main character all the time. Yeah. They're doing different things. So it diverges. I did a couple like that. And it Is only ended Ender's shadow like that. I couldn't, Horses I tried life. reading the Ender's books multiple times and I just can't get into it. I think the problem is that I, I was recommending them from um, Fantasy Fanatic Friends. We were both adults in our thirties and I just could not, I've never been able to read past the first chapter of any of the Ender's books. I've tried. I, like I got through Harry one. Potter because my friend made me. We were also adults, but his son had to read it. And he's like, look, I have to read this to know if, he, if I can let my kid read it. You have to read it with me. And he came by every day because we worked in an office. So what did you think of that chapter? How many chapters have you? Like, <laughs> I didn't get a choice, man. You were, <laughs> this was peer be pressure. Quiz on it. So I did get through those. But he didn't do that with Ender's Game because he'd already read it. It was more like, well, have you read it yet? Have you read it yet? I cried. I can't get into it. I tried the audiobook, an ebook. I just can't get past the first chapter. I don't like the main character. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes it really hard to read the book. And understandable. Ender's Shadow is from the perspective of someone who kind of became like his sidekick and then kind of came into his own and did great things. But a lot of it is just his perspective on how some of the big things in the first book went down. And that can be very fascinating to read. When I tried to do it, I thought the whole book was going to be just their perspective on it. And it ended up just being third of the book was and then it just diverged and like they were doing all these things that like we didn't even know about that were going and it went off in its own thing and that was kind of cool it is cool i think all the characters are the main character to themselves you know i think everybody thinks they're the hero of their own story well she definitely yeah. was reyna is she is the love interest but she's barely a side character like she steals every scene she's in she's just very no nonsense like the the valley Below the mountain where the monastery is, is also the home to a military academy. And she's been training her whole life to get into this military academy because she wants to be a knight. And women can get in, it's just not as common. So where Vass is being trained by a knight, she's always trying to get him to help her. So she like sneak attacks him while he's in the field and just to, to get some sparring in. She's a, she's a spitfire of a character. Those are fun. Those are so fun. But we are almost out of time, so we're going to have to wrap. It was great having you on here. Any any last words you want to say to listeners or viewers before we end? Dark Lament ebook is on sale for 99 cents right now. You can go to simongram.com to, to sign up for my newsletter. There's also a book trailer there if you want to check out the... It's actually playing up here behind me. <laughs> I was wondering what that was. Yeah, that's the that's the book trailer. I was like, I have an empty shelf. I have to do something with it. And I'm on Twitter, the Simon Graham, and I'm on Facebook. And hopefully, you're gonna see a lot more of me. And I'm gonna have all that linked in the show notes of the description, depending on awesome. where people are listening. So you don't have to grab your pen and pencil and try and write this down. You can just like <laughs> click the link. That's probably a lot easier. Yeah. And so thank you so much for coming. This has been fantastic. And you know, I hope that your book. Get some of this everyone. Hope mine does well, too. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. You're and welcome. thanks for doing this and thanks for having me. But I definitely hope you progress yeah. in, the, in the contest. Thank you so much. I am your host, indie fantasy author Melinda Cusera, and I write books about magic and the characters who use it. And they live in a wild fantasy world of my own invention. And you can 
check out my books as well at the links below. I recommend you start with Curse Breaker Enchanted, my favorite book and the first book in the Curse Breaker series, which is my book, Baby. And why are we doing all of these interviews? A few weeks ago, I entered my book, Curse Breaker Enchanted, in the self-published fantasy blog off. This year is number nine. And I thought it might be cool to interview my fellow entrants. Only 300 books can enter the contest, 10 will advance to the semifinals, and one will be crowned the winner. I hope you're cheering for Curse Breaker Enchanted. You can grab it for free, either the ebook or the audiobook version right now. Also have those links in the show notes as well. If you want to get even more involved, you can join my community on Patreon and start reading the 10th book of the Curse Breaker series, Shards for His Gift, which was supposed to be a novella, but the characters ran up with the plot and now we're chasing dragons and it is not a novella at all. We've become a full length book that's probably gonna be the second longest book in the Curse Breaker series and the sheer amount of shenanigans these characters got into. But you will love every minute of their magical mayhem and I'm hopefully writing the final chapters this weekend in between all of the interviews. So if you do head over to Patreon, you can read, there's about 66 chapters posted. There's also chapters posted for Rogue Rescue, which is the fourth book in the Robin of Larkspur series, which I'm going to switch to writing as soon as I finish Shards for His Gift and when that heads off into editing. And there's also the other books that I have written on Patreon there. It's all in there and you can check it out and support what I'm doing and get copies of the books and get thanked in every book before anybody else. So thank you so much for joining us. And I hope that you will be back to listen again soon. Please remember to like and subscribe and or set it to auto download or do all of the things so that you be notified every time there is a new podcast. I will return to reading from my books as well as discussing the lore behind them. I just need to get through some of the interviews first. I didn't realize that when I offered to give these interviews that there'd be so much demand for it. So I'm a little bit overscheduled. But I hope that you enjoy these interviews and add some great books to your to be read list and also pick up some of them to read. And all of the guest books are linked below as well. So thank you again for joining us. Have a great day or a great night, depending on where you are.